Thanks for having me here. So I'm going to talk about the recent progress in the theory of deep learning. And the slides will be online, online afterwards um, on my website. So as the um, title suggests, um, the main concern of this talk is how can we use mathematical thinking to formalize, understand, and improve deep learning. We have seen great empirical success of deep learning to many um, areas of artificial intelligence in the last few years. Uh, however, there are a lot of mysteries about deep learning that we don't understand. Um, I think addressing these mysteries would, um, um, I hope that um, it would um, um, sustain and boost the progress of the field in the long run. Um, so I think this talk uh, is going to be more about raising questions, um, summarizing what we don't know about deep learning, um, than um, you know, providing answers about these questions. Of course, I'll summarize what we know about deep learning, but I think the, the questions are the driving force of this talk. So, um, so in mo most part of this talk, I'm going to spend uh, time uh, on uh, supervised learning. Uh, I'm going to cover concepts like optimization, statistics, and generalization, and modeling or architectural choice. So I'm using the word modeling in a broader sense uh, that include both um, the, the formulation of the problem and also uh, the choice of the network architecture that people use to impose inductive bias in the modeling. So one striking phenomenon I found about deep learning um, is that the interactions between uh, these concepts uh, are uh, very rich and uh, somewhat uh, actually fundamental for our understanding. Of course, for, you know, when we, uh, before the deep learning age, uh, when we do uh, kernel method, for example, so kernel method is an example of um, kind of the interaction between optimization and uh, generalization in the sense that you, know, you achieve both computational tractability and the modeling of flexibility. But I think in deep learning, somehow, um, the interactions between these are, are even richer and more fundamental. And I don't see a way to even talk about all of these concepts separately, um, per se. So, so I think this kind of interaction is going to be a recurring theme of this talk. Uh, I'll also spend like um, 20 to 30 minutes to talk about some other theory about deep learning in the context of unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. All right. So the first part of the talk is about optimization in deep learning. So the obvious questions about optimization are, you know, how can we provide guarantees on the runtime and the quality of the solutions? And how do we optimize better? And the ob obvious optical uh, in deep learning um, about optimization is that we don't have uh, convexity. And this um, uh, caused a lot of trouble because um, you know, there are a lot of intractability results. You know, finding a global minima of a general non-convex function is np hard and so on and so forth. So I think one of the main questions is how do we um, uh, phrase the optimization question in the context of deep learning so that we can you know, uh, get something uh, meaningful. So, so the phrasing of the question, I think, is quite important. And I'll start with that. So one of the ways to kind of uh, phrase the question is this, uh, what I call as problem agnost agnostic, or so-called black box optimization. So, um, you know, so, the opt so we want to design an optimizer. An optimizer is given a function. And we know the function probably is a sum of functions. Uh, this is typical in machine learning applications. And, uh, and if I, for example, we know there have some uh, regularity conditions like Lipschitz or smooth. And then we give this function and maybe the gradient, the second order derivative of this function to an optimizer. And the optimizer have to um, return us an approximate local minimum. So the reason here I only ask for approximate local minimum is that uh, finding a global minimum is NP-hard. And even finding actually an, an exact local minimum is NP-hard. So we can only shoot for approximate local minimum under some sense of approximation. And uh, another thing I would like to mention that is that um, a stationary point does not suffice. Because uh, in many, uh, in most of the um, non-convex objectives in deep learning, there are a lot of stationary points. Like there are probably exponential number of stationary points that are not global minimum, that are not good enough uh, for the quality of the solution. So I think the main thing about this kind of problem agnostic or black box optimization is that it asks the optimizers to work for all possible Fs in some time t that depends on and the and the, you know the the epsilon the approximation error, so because you don't really know anything more than uh, anything more about f other than um, f is a sum of function f is Lipschitz or smooth, so you know if you phrase the you know, question in this way, so we have to ask uh, if you want to prove a theorem you have to ask for um, for it to work for all possible f, so 
the, the pros about this kind of phrasing is that you know, it's a clean interface, and optimizers don't need to understand its application, so we, I don't have to care about how F is produced. Um, I only need I have to satisfy these simple properties. Um, and uh, there are strong positive and negative results. So we know uh, upper bounds and lower bounds uh, about the convergence rate. We have a lot of mathematical tools to make the, the bounds tighter and tighter. There are still some improvable gap, though. So the downside is that um, if you um, prove a theorem like this, then uh, likely um, the, the algorithm won't leverage a, a the structure of the particular problem, because you ask the optimizers to work for all possible function f. So, and the thing is that for non-convex functions, basically this kind of um, you know, um, these structures are, are too little uh, for non-convex functions, and and we need more structures to really make uh, you know more ambitious to achieve more ambitious goals. So, um, so there's another way to phrase it, which is you know you only work on optimizations for concrete problems. So we still want to design an algorithm, but the input of the algorithm now is going to be a machine learning problem instead of just a loss function. So we have to specify what's the input and output. We have to, we have to specify the, the parameters, the models, to, uh, to, uh, to model the, the relationship between the input and output. Uh, probably we also want to specify a loss function. And the algorithm uh, is going to um, um, take in all of this into account and find uh, maybe a global minimum of the loss function f. So the key difference here is that now we only, asks, uh, we only ask the algorithm to work for the particular function f that is produced by this machine learning problem, or the, pr the particular family of functions f that is produced by this kind of problem. So in some sense, we are treating generality for more ambitious goals. Because now, uh, all the you know, intractability results don't hold anymore. And uh, in many cases, we can hope for uh, uh, solving uh, to get a global minimum of the objective function f. And we can hope for faster runtime. So um, it encourages um, leveraging the structure of the problem. Uh, and sometimes even you don't change the algorithms to customize to the problem. You can also, even, uh, you can also have a customized analysis for the same algorithm. So let me have an example um, about this kind of uh, ways to phrase non-convex optimization. So um, let's talk about a linearized one hidden layer network. This is very simple. So uh, we have input x. Uh, we we'll, you know, have one layer w1, and we pass it through some activation, and then another layer w2, and we get output. Right, so, and, uh, so y hat, the output, is uh, w2 sigma w1x. And the sigma, you know, the activation function, is um, identity function for the purpose of this slice. Um, so, so basically, it's just a, you know, a stack of two linear layers. And let's consider, even for simplicity, you know, a square loss. So y is the label, and y hat is our prediction. We take the square uh, loss. And the loss, the final loss we want to optimize is the sum of losses over all changing examples. So this sounds very simplistic. But the point is that you can prove a quite strong theorem here. So if you assume identity, the, uh, the activation is identity and the square loss, then stochastic with intent can converge uh, from a random initialization to a global minimum of this object function, and actually with exponential decay of error. And, um, and the, the, the kind of the reason why we can have a relatively strong statement here is that because the structure of the problem, uh, because we don't have nonlinear activations, so the problem is very close to solving PCA uh, with SGD. Uh, and, uh, but just to know that if you don't use the structure, then such a strong result is not possible without using the structure, because um, there are all kind of lower bounds for non-convex optimization. The problem is still non-convex. Um, so the caveat is that um, the statement is false when sigma is a uh, ReLU, sigmoid, or tangent h, you know, whatever you care you know, in deep learning. So, um, uh, but we will talk about this you know, five slides, uh, probably five slides later. Um, so the point here is that if you consider a special problem, then you can hope to get uh, stronger results. And um, um, so what structures functions beyond convexity can we leverage in the optimization? That's a little bit more general question. So, um, so one candidate kind of structure um, is that all local minima are global. And actually, that's the structure that we used in the previous slide. So, so technically, there are actually two conditions. The first one is that all local minima are global minima. And second one is that all saddle points are not flat, uh, meaning 
all set of points have a strictly negative curvature. So this is an example of functions like this. So um, you know, all the local minima of this function are global. They all have error 0. And uh, for example, the saddle point here uh, indeed has a strictly negative curvature pointing inwards. Um, so uh, if you have such a structure, then you know that um, we can converge to a global minimum. So uh, stochastic descent and actually many other algorithms can converge to a global minimum of the function f in polynomial time. Um, so the key here is that you know, um, saddle point is not an issue because uh, saddle point is not stable under the presence of noise. So you can kind of escape the saddle points um, with the help of the noise. And, and because all local minima are global, so that if you converge to a local minimum, then you converge to a global minimum. All right, so, so and, uh, and uh, it sounds like you know, this uh, kind of structure is very strong. But um, um, in one of the paper by uh, Kramanska et al., so they uh, conjecture that the loss function for new networks actually have uh, very similar properties uh, to, um, um, to, to this kind of properties. So uh, they use some statistical physics to justify that um, um, uh, under various assumptions, then the deep nice possibly could have um, uh, structures like this. So, so this structure is not uh, that far from uh, realistic. So um, you know, if you have some structure like this, then we can kind of leverage the optimization landscape, the, the loss surface um, in, the, in the framework of the optimization. So now um, you know, we have an ML or machine learning problem. And now the first step would be you know, we analyze the, the optimization landscape. Probably we show that the landscape looks like this. And then we can apply some general optimizers with or without customization. And uh, then we can hope to have a global minimum of the function f. So there are um, a plethora of uh, results um, on matrix factorization-based problems and tensor problems that use this kind of workflow. So you analyze the landscape, and then you apply general optimizers. And, uh, and there are also quite a few attentions, extensions to shallow or linearized neural nets, which I'm going to summarize in the next slide. So this is just a partial list. Um, so I think the first um, result along this line probably is uh, the isotonic regression um, paper, which um, by Kakedi et al. So um, isotonic re regression is basically a new network without any hidden layer. So you just have a linear layer and a long linear activation function. Um, um, you can, ex you know, we, we know that for matrix completion and matrix sensing, the network, the landscape has this property that all local minima are global, and matrix completion and matrix sensing are pretty much a linearized network with one hidden layer. So you have two weight matrix and uh, matrices, and uh, there's no uh, nonlinear activation in between them. Uh, we know the landscape of phase retrieval. We have uh, some results about, you know, there are results about tensor decompositions and also linearized neural networks, meaning you remove the activations um, uh, from the neural nets. It's still a non convex objective if you have multiple layers um, and there are analysis on the landscape of linearized neural networks. And uh, there are also analysis on one hidden layer network with non overlapping units meaning all the hidden units you know, care about different parts of the input. And in this case, you can also show that the landscape is good. So I think one of the, um, um, uh, one of the point here is that you know, a few of these um, uh, uh, references also customize their algorithm uh, or analysis to give stronger runtime or sample complexity guarantees, better than uh, what the generic optimizer can offer. So, so the next question is, you know, recall that after, uh, in one of the previous slides, I said that if you have a two-layer network and with ReLU or sigmoid activation, then uh, we cannot converge to a global minimum without any modification. So, so that brings us to this question, you know, uh, what if uh, you know, the landscape is not great, it's not as uh, good as what we um, thought? So for example, if the landscape is like this, um, what, ha what, what, what can we do? So, so here's another idea to kind of go beyond uh, the landscape. So, you know, because we are doing machine learning, so there's no reason why we have to stick to uh, the, the model, the architecture we are using, and the loss function we are using. Because anyway, they are just uh, means instead of, you know, goals. So uh, we can do this landscape design by changing the model. So we can, you know, possibly have a new parametrization of our model, or maybe a new, um, completely new model, or a new loss function. And, um, but we still want to solve the same uh, problem. 
So maybe after the, the reparameterization or the new loss function, then the landscape becomes much better. And then we can uh, apply our generic optimizers and get, um, and so the, so the question here, so we have to be a little bit uh, careful about what we uh, care about here, right? Because now we have already uh, discard the original loss function. So we don't want to talk about uh, whether we converge the global minimum of the original loss function. So I think what makes sense is you talk about whether we can uh, have a prediction model with good test error. Because if you, don't, if you only care about training error, then there may be other ways to cheat. For example, you could have a super, super big parameterization that memorizes all of the training example. So you don't want to uh, allow that in the, um, in the framework. So, so this landscape design idea is a pretty powerful uh, idea. And I actually, I think that's pretty much what really happens in deep learning. So let me give uh, three examples uh, to flesh out these kind of ideas. So the first example is uh, residual networks. Of course, I think the, 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 the original motivation of residual network is not for op optimization per se. Um, um, uh, but uh, but uh, we found that actually it has a lot of things to do um, with optimization. So if you compare a standard feed-forward network with a residual network, right? So a standard feed-forward network is just, uh, you know, uh, that's for simplicity, let's say, it's a you know, stack of fully connected layers with ReLU activation. And uh, the residual connection, you know, um, it's just you know, adding some you know, identity connection from layer 0 to layer 2 and layer 2 to layer 4, so on and so forth. So if you really think about it for a minute, then actually you can prove that uh, they have the same uh, representational power or expressivity up to a slightly change of number of parameters. You can have a feed forward network and uh, you know, add a few parameters and make it a residual network, or you could uh, do it vice versa. So they don't really, you know, um, they don't really have different representational power. And what really differ uh, is that uh, they have very different training curve, for, especially for very deep models. So this suggests that the architectural choice has an influence on the optimization landscape. And uh, towards understanding this, we have a very simplified model uh, for first cut understanding. So we can understand the linearized version of this uh, residual connection. So what we do is that we say, OK, let's remove the ReLU activation, which we don't know how to understand. Uh, and let's consider this linearized network. So, so the model itself now is not interesting anymore because it's just a linear function of the data. But the optimization is still interesting because if you're really thinking about optimizing over the matrices, the matrices A1 up to AK, um, th this is still a non-convex optimization problem. So we could talk about you know, how, um, how residual connection changes the optimization, even though the modeling perspective is not relevant. And uh, it turns out that um, the residual connection helped optimization. So on the left-hand side, if you have a feed-forward network, so there exist uh, flight um, saddle points in the sense that there are uh, this kind of points with zero gradient, zero Hessian, and even zero higher-order derivatives. However, if you consider a uh, residual network, then um, all stationary points with small norm are global minimum. So we don't have this kind of you know, bad saddle points anymore. Um, because all the stationary points actually are, are good uh, global minimum. Um, you may wonder you know, whether small norm uh, put a restriction to us. Um, that's not the case because um, there exists a global minimum with small norm. So basically, we can just restrict our attention to the uh, set of solutions with small norm. And then in that uh, uh, set, all uh, the landscape is good. So this suggests that the residual connections improve the landscape, um, the properties of the landscape. So of course, here we only analyze the linear uh, um, activations. So the open question is, how do we uh, understand the landscape property of ResNet with nonlinear activation? Um, so, so the next example I'm going to give about you know, how do we change the landscape is uh, over parameterization. We know that over parameterization empirically helps um, uh, to improve the landscape. So here is an empirical experiment. So um, we, are, we have some synthetic experiments so that we know the lens, um, um, more about the, um, the ground truth. So we have a teacher-student setup in the sense that we generate a large amount of data, effectively infinite, infinite number of amount of data, of, by a fixed two-layer network with 100 hidden units. And let's call this new network W1 star W2 star. So Y is equal to W1 star sigma of W2 star X. So 
Um, so you consider this as a teacher network, or this is a true network that generates the label. And now, uh, and then the loss function is just the L2 um, uh, loss for simplicity. Uh, W1, W2 are my um, a prediction model, are the variables I want to optimize. So the question here is, what's the dimension of W1 and W2? Right, the most natural idea is that because my data is generated from a two-layer hidden, two hidden layer network with 100 hidden units, then it makes sense for me to train with the same architecture. Right? So I parameterize my W1 and W2 with the same size as W1 star and W2 star, and I just train it with uh, gradient descent, or stochastic gradient descent. So and uh, if you do that, we know that the global minimum has error 0, because we know that if you set W1 to W1 star, W2 to W2 star, then that's a global minimum. However, if you really train it, you found that um, the, 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 the error is not great. So because we here we are using you know, infinite, almost infinite amount of data, so training error and test error don't really differ. So I just draw one uh, curve. So and we see that the, both the training and test uh, you know, plateaus after some point. Uh, you can tune this experiment more carefully to you know, decrease the learning rate. But you know, in any cases, it plateaus. And actually, um, uh, one of the paper by uh, Safran and Shamir, they proved that they are by the local minimum. So this you know, place we converge to is actually a bad local minimum. It's not a global minimum. So this is a pretty pessimistic um, result, but um, th there is a simple way to save it. So the only thing we have to do is we have to enlarge network in the training model. So we just make the parameterization W1, W2 bigger. So W1 now is a mapping from input dimension to 400, and W2 is from 400 to number of labels. And now if we train it, then we see that the, the, the training and test error converges to a zero error, which is um, a global minimum, because you cannot go below zero. So this suggests that if you over parameterize your network more than what you really need, then there's a good chance that it's going to make the problem much easier to optimize. So uh, I still open question why this can happen, uh, especially for the nonlinear case. Uh, but there are a few results, um, inspiring partial results towards uh, this direction. So uh, let me summarize some of them. So the setup here, just to um, define some numbers, so k is the number of um, hidden units, n is the number of data points, and d is the input dimension. So the theorem by Sorge et al. Common 16 shows that if you use leaky uh, ReLU activation and squared loss, and if uh, we over parameterize in the sense that k times d is bigger than n. So recall k times d is basically the number of parameters in the weight matrix on W1. So if the number of parameters in W1 is bigger than the number of examples, then all differentiable stationary points are global minimum. So at least you won't converge, you won't converge to a bad uh, differentiable stationary points, because there are no bad differentiable stationary points. So there's a small caveat, uh, you know, actually a relatively big caveat, uh, which is um, uh, the optimizers do converge to non-differentiable uh, stationary points um, in, uh, empirically. So this doesn't you know, address completely the problem. Um, there's another uh, paper, recent paper, by uh, Simon uh, Du and Jason Lee, which shows that if you have quadratic activation, so the activation is just a square, um, and the loss function is also square loss, then if k is bigger than uh, square root 2n, and W2, um, the, the weight matrix is just all, all one matrix, then all the local minima are global. So the strength here is that now we don't have the non-differentiability issue. All the local minima are global. It's great. Um, the only um, the downside is that uh, um, you know the, the the limitation is that we only work it only works for quadratic activations. Um, and one of the strengths um, of both of these paper is that uh, they both assume very little about the data distribution and labels. So um, you know, it depends on how you view it. You know, in some sense, it's a, it's a big feature, but sometimes it also can be viewed as a small bug, because if you don't assume the data distribution, anything about data distribution and labels, probably uh, it's hard to get a uh, very good result when you have um, you know, more and more non-linearities. Um, and another question is, can this model generalize? So this is a serious concern, especially in the first case, right, in the Soldier and Common paper. So KD is bigger than N. So the number of parameters is bigger than, than, than the number of uh, examples. So, um, so it's 
A priori, it's not clear whether these models can generalize. It's very likely they can just memorize. Um, but the answer is actually uh, yes. So these kind of models could generalize if you tune them correctly. And I'll discuss that uh, in the second part of the um, talk. So um, just to mention that uh, you know, if we consider recurring network and we linearize them, we can also see some benefit um, from the mathematical point of view um, that overparametrization has a benefit in optimization. All right, so um, the last example about a landscape design. Um, so there, um, there's another recent work I was involved in that tried to kind of define new loss functions to uh, make the landscape better. So here we make even more assumptions. We assume that the data come from a Gaussian distribution. And uh, recall that if you don't do overparameterization, the square loss has a bad local minimum. And uh, what we do with Jason and um, Jason Lee and Rong Ge is that we design an alternative objective function, which is kind of complicated, but in a nutshell, it's an expectation of some loss function over the examples. And, uh, and we, know, we prove that this alternative objective function has the same global minima as the standard square loss. So we preserve the global minima. And also, the landscape now becomes much better. So all local minima of f are global. So now we can just optimize this uh, function f, and we can get the global minima of the square loss. So, so we get theoretical guarantees for ReLU activation. Actually, it also works for many other activations, and we don't need any overparametrization. So, um, so without over, so the, um, there's a small benefit of not using overparametrization because if you don't use overparametrization, you can hope to recover the ground truth parameter, and you can hope that uh, the, um, the network can extrapolate to all the points that um, um, all the ends in possible um, data points, you know, even beyond the the, um, the distribution of the input. Um, anyway, so but there is a caveat here as well. So F is very complicated. And uh, we do you know, implement uh, F, and it works in practice, but it requires um, um, a lot of um, examples. So even though we don't overparameterize somehow, because you really define a loss function, the, the generalization guarantees become uh, worse. So all right. So I guess with this note, uh, um, let me conclude about um, the optimization, just a short summary. So uh, fast approval non-convex optimization is possible if the optimization landscape has particular properties. For example, all local minima are global. And the uh, landscape can be reshaped or designed uh, by changing the model architecture and the loss function. So again, the interactions between you know, uh, optimization and landscape uh, is via uh, optimization and the architectural choice is via the landscape of the loss function. All right. So, um, the next part of the talk is going to be about um, generalization theory in deep learning, why overparameterized neural networks can generalize. So this also relates to um, the optimization part, because uh, you know, we want to make the optimization work, we have to use overparameterization, and then we have the concern about whether it can generalize. And now let's address the, the generalization issue. At least let's talk about it. Um, so, and I think the interesting part about this um, um, section is that uh, the generalization now actually have a rich interaction between uh, with the optimization. So often when you think about you know the, um, the the generalization power, you think this is about you know the model capacity, right? This is about you know how do you choose your architecture. But actually here uh, we found that um, you know um, the optimization plays an important role in generalization. So um, speaking of generalization theory, right? So um, let's start with the overfitting. Right? This is a textbook uh, version of the overfitting explanation. Right? So if you increase your model capacity, then the training error likely is going to decrease. Um, but the test error is going to you know, decrease at the beginning. But at some point, it, you overfit. You probably memorize the training data. And then the test error starts to increase. And um, uh, the generalization error is often defined as the difference between test error and training error. So, However, uh, and, and, you know, and, uh, and the, the standard way to kind of explain this um, via generalization theory, via the so-called uniform convergence, is the following. So you prove a statement like this. So there exists a set of parameters, sorry, sorry, for any set of parameter theta, the test loss minus the training loss is at most square root c over n. So here c is the model capacity, and n is the number of data points. 
So from this formula, you can see that if you increase the model capacity, then potentially the test minus training is going to be become bigger and bigger. So the generalization error is going to become bigger. Um, and at some point, the generalization error dominates the training error, and then you start to see overfitting. So and, and often, you know, the model capacity is bounded by the number of parameters. Um, and number of parameters is a reasonable good choice to, you know, to understand the model capacity. However, this is not quite the case uh, in deep learning. So in real life deep learning training, so the network size is not the complexity measure anymore. Uh, at least it's not a great complexity, complexity measure anymore. So this is an experiment um, by uh, uh, Nishiba et al. Um, in an accurate paper in 2015. So on three layer network on MNIST. And here you are allowed to change you know, architecture you know, by a lot because you know, the data is small. So um, I think what they do is they use um, uh, four hidden units until, until you know, 400, uh, 4,000 hidden units in the architecture. So you increase the, the size of the architecture actually affected by a million uh, times from 4 to 4K. So, uh, and, uh, and we see that the, the training error you know, goes to zero after we use 64 uh, hidden units. Uh, but however, you know, um, from 64 to 4K, the, the test error is still decreasing. Even the training error plateaus to at zero. And you never see the test error increase as the, um, as the, the model becomes bigger and bigger. So and there are also similar results um, on CIFAR, which um, uh, I've done myself. And in general, you know, by and large, this is consistent with large-scale experiments. So the network size is not a great complexity measure. Then what other complexity measure? So you may wonder, OK, we are often using you know, L2 regularization to, you know, even though a very weak L2 regularization, but we do use L2 regularization in, um, in training. So um, but empirically, L2 norm of the um, uh, network doesn't correlate very well with the generalization error either. So there are um, a series of recent work on um, more informative complex measures. So one of them is um, normalized margin. So the definition is that you take the product of the some norm of the weight matrices in each layer, and you normalize by the margin, the effective margin you have seen, uh, and this is the complexity measure. There's also a compression-based complexity measure, which is defined as uh, the minimum compression, compression of the model. And they also show that the minimum compression of the model is uh, upper bounded by some notion of noise stability, which you can measure empirically. And there's also a pack-based bound for the complex measure. So this, is, this kind of bound only works for stochastic networks. You have to have a random network. Uh, and the bound is a KL between your estimated stochastic network with the prior uh, stochastic network. So all of these bounds, uh, complex measure, um, are correlate uh, are better, at least much better than L2 norm uh, with the, um, the, the generalization error in deep learning. So, and uh, also there's a, a third one, uh, a fourth one, which is not exactly about the complex measure of the weight matrix, um, but it's kind of uh, in that line. So a flat mi local minima tends to generalize better. So the idea is that if you have a flat local minima, then it's uh, less sensitive to the perturbation, the kind of the difference between training and test. That's kind of why intuitively it's possible that flat min local minima is going to generalize better. So all of this, you know, uh, complexity measure, um, so they are um, kind of post-mortem analysis in the sense that uh, all of this analysis works in a way that um, you give me a, a, a new network, and uh, you specify the weight parameters. And then I can you know, examine these weight parameters, say, say the norm is small, or the compression is good, or, or the margin is good. And then I can decide, OK, this network could have a good generalization error. So, but they don't explain why such low complexity solution are obtained at the first place. So, and, um, and also this is, and what is worse, is, so like, what is more interesting is that uh, how you obtain this kind of solution uh, do matter. So the algorithms do matter uh, in the generalization theory of deep learning. And the reason is that because the lack of convexity, so the same objective, the same regularization, and even the same training error doesn't really imply you have the same test error. So this is a little bit different from the convex case. You know, if you have a strongly convex objective, then there is always a unique uh, minimizer. Uh, so all optimizers, if you if converges, 
um, uh, if they converge, then they will converge to the same minimizer. But this is not true for non-convex objective. So with the same objective and regularization, you can still converge to different local minima, which generalize differently. Um, and, and also, what is worse is that faster algorithms also don't necessarily mean uh, better uh, or faster generalization. So I could have a lot of different ways to design fast algorithms that don't generalize. This is just a super trivial example, which, which is you just um, um, uh, make the learning rate smaller. So uh, here, the orange curve uh, is um, with learning rate 0 0.01, and the green curve is with learning rate 0.1. And you can see that the training error uh, decreases to 0 faster in the orange case, in the 0 0.01 case. Um, but the test error you know, at the beginning decreases faster uh, with smaller learning rate, but at the end, the test error with larger learning rate uh, wins. And this is true if you run it for you know, long enough time as well. So, um, so the only difference between these two plots are that we use different learning rate, and it converts to solutions with different test error. And, um, and the problem also with this also hurts the optimization, because the mysteries in generalization hamper the study of optimization. So in the last year or two years, I think probably I've came up with you know, probably five algorithms that can convert faster on the training data set, but they, none of them works on the test data set. So, so it seems that even you know, vice versa, if you want to study optimization, you also have to take the generalization theory into account. So and, and, um, and uh, to study generalization theory, the algorithms matter. So it seems that um, there is an algorithmic regularization in deep learning uh, that's happening. So the hypothesis here is that you know, stochastic descent or other algorithms with proper initialization and learning rate, they could possibly prefer an optimal solution with low complexity when it exists. So let me parse this hypothesis a little bit. So SGD and proper learning rate and, and the initialization, this suggests that the algorithms and also actually the ways that you use the algorithm uh, matters uh, for generalization. And when the when the low complexity solution exists, this phrase means that the intrinsic complexity of the data also matters. So if your data you know, is intrinsically you know, very random, for example, the labels are random, then there's no way you can hope to have generalization. But if your data is of low complexity, then there exists an optimal solution with low complexity, and likely SGD could possibly find it. Of course, there's a, missing, a lot of missing parts about this hypothesis, and the main things are, you know, what's the definition of complexity? Right, what's the right definition? I have listed a few of them, um, and whether they are the correct definition. And also, how do we prove that the algorithms converge to uh, the low complex solution? Or how do we design a new algorithm that can prove, can provably converge to the low complexity solution? So, so here are some progress uh, along this line of algorithmic regularization. So for linear models, um, actually, if you don't, you know, uh, have um, you have some you know non-degenerates in the sense that uh, if it's over parameterized, we can also see some uh, effect of algorithmic regularizations. For example, a folklore uh, result is that if you use linear regression and you have over parameterization, you have a lot of parameters than the number of data points. Then linear regression with initialization zero converges to the minimum L2 norm solution. So you get the L2 norm for free uh, by running gradient descent. And if you run mirror descent, you're going to converge to a solution with minimum Brachman divergence to the initial uh, starting point. So you get a uh, uh, Brachman divergence for free if you run mirror descent. And if you use logistic regression then uh, and the gradient descent, you're going to converge to the max margin solution even though you don't encourage the solution, uh, the, you don't encourage the max margin explicitly. So, um, and, uh, and there are also recent results on you know, how do we extend all of these linear models to uh, nonlinear models. For example, we can extend to this, um, uh, the, the work Gunasca, Gunasca et al. extend this to uh, neural networks with linear activations. So the model is still linear in the data, but the optimization, again, is non-convex uh, non in the parameters. And they show that if you run gradient descent um, uh, on convolutional neural networks, um, then gradient descent automatically regularizes the norm in the frequency space. So you're going to get a sparse solution uh, in, in the frequency space. So, um, and in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the work uh, on neural networks with quadratic activations. So you take this, use the square as the activation, and then uh, there we can show that gradient descent with small initialization converges to the minimum rank solution. And the rank is the right complex measure when you have quadratic activation. 
And uh, they also works on uh, new art works on linearly separable data. So here the data is linearly separable. So the data is intrinsically low complexity, and then you can show that uh, new networks actually converge if, even if you have a very big network. All right. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about this work on uh, one hidden layer quadratic new networks with over parameterization. So the setup is very simple. So we have a new network. Um, actually, only the 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 first layer is, um, um, is unknown. So we have a, um, a weight matrix that maps dimension D to dimension M. And uh, uh, the, the second layer is assumed to be all one uh, unknown. So and we have n data points, and they are from Gaussian for simplicity. And we have quadratic activations. And we use a mean squared error for the loss. So uh, yi is the, the true label, and y hat is the prediction. And we just take the difference and square. We take this average. So the question is, suppose I only have very limited number of data points. So my n is smaller than the total number of parameters, which is d times n. Can we still hope to uh, learn a model that can generalize? And the answer is yes, but, uh, the, um, but we need uh, additional assumptions. So it's impossible without additional assumptions, because uh, if the labels are random, then there's no hope you can generalize with so uh, few number of label uh, data points. So what are the assumptions? As I suggested, uh, as alluded before, the assumptions is that the, uh, the labels are of intrinsic low complexity. So we assume that there exists a small network of sets R, of hidden sets R, that can produce the label. So, so this is how the label is produced. You have a U star, which is uh, of smaller size, and it can produce the label, let's say exactly. Oh, I think uh, I found that uh, my laptop is of low battery, so just uh, quickly fix that. Um. I think I have a. Oh, yeah, I have a charger here, actually. I just forgot to charge it. Um, sorry. Because I don't know how, how fast they're going to run out of battery. Is there a chart um, place to? Oh, here, OK, cool. OK, great. Yes, it's started. Oh, it's only 3%. OK. Uh, OK, sorry for the interruption. OK, so OK, just recap. So we assume that the data are from a low complexity new network. But we train them with a big new network. And here's the theorem. So if we, ch if we have a, such a setup and we have n is roughly equals to d times r squared number of examples. So the number of examples doesn't depend on uh, how large the network is. It only depends on how large the intrinsic uh, network, the, uh, uh, how large the network that produced the label is. Uh, and if you have d times r squared examples, we didn't send with initialization of size alpha returns a solution with test error about d times alpha. So let me parse this. So alpha seems to be a big number, but actually we are going to take alpha to be super small. Um, say alpha is like a 1 over d to the 10. And then the generalization error is negligible because d times alpha is very small. And the cost of doing this is um, also small because uh, the number of iterations you need uh, to get this uh, test error is t, which is equal to square root log d over alpha. So, uh, and if you take alpha to be 1 over d to the 10, then you only lose a logarithmic in d in the number of iterations. So it's OK. So basically, this says that if you use a small enough initialization, then uh, even though you have over parameterization, it's going to generalize. What's small, like normal, so like Sorry? What do you mean by small? Oh, sure. So alpha, by alpha, I mean the spectral norm of the initialization of the weights. And because alpha is pretty small, so pretty much all norm wouldn't matter that much. Yeah. So um, yeah, actually, we use the orthogonal um, initialization, small orthogonal initialization with a uh, special norm alpha. So and, and one of the interesting points here is that stochasticity and early stop uh, is not necessary, um, both in the theory and in practice. Um, just a quick uh, simulation. So, uh, to show this is indeed true in practice. So you, let's say we have an uh, input dimension 100 or 200. 
and we generate labels with a network of size r is equal to 5. So, and we have, let's say we use uh, d square parameters, we, like the hidden variable, uh, the hidden dimension has size d. And uh, let's say we have only 5 times d times r number of examples, which is equal to 25d number of examples. So this is much bigger than d, much smaller than d square when d is about 100 or 200. In this setup, we can see that the test error, you know, still goes to a very small, you know, amount. When you use a small enough initialization, the test error goes below uh, 0.005. Um, so this is the normalized test error. So the, the trivial test error would be one. So and we can see that the test error continue to go down as we train fa uh, more and more. If you train it longer enough, it still goes down. Okay, so uh, why this can be true? So the key intuition, as we alluded before, is that good incent prefers low complexity uh, solution. And uh, uh, let's uh, flesh this out a little bit more. So what's the definition of complexity? So here the definition is the following. So if a network is approximately equal to, equivalent to another network of our hidden units, then let's call it intrinsic, let's call the intrinsic complexity to be R. So if a network is kind of compressible to a size R network, then the complexity is R, but only approximately comp complex, uh, compressible. Um, and uh, you know, just um, in picture, so if you have a big network and you can write it as a small network, then the complexity of the big network is just um, defined to be two. And uh, it happens that for quadratic network with quadratic activations, uh, the complexity is equals to approximate rank of the weight. So, and uh, let's define S sub k to be the, all of the models with complexity less than k. Then, you know, you know, as k increases, we have a bigger, bigger site, and zero is approximately rank zero. Um, uh, zero is approximately rank zero solution, right? So, um, and we start, so, okay, so uh, in the set SR, in the set of models with uh, complexity at most r, there exists a generalizable global minimum of the training loss, right? This is the, this is the network that produced the label, right? We assume that there exists a network that produced the label with size r. And that's the green point. But there are also non-generalizable global minima of higher rank, and they are not inside S sub r. And uh, what happens is that you initialize very close to zero, and you run gradient descent, and somehow gradient descent, you know, uh, prefers to stay closer to close as close to zero as possible, and uh, uh, and uh, you know it uh, you know gradually searches through S1 and S2 and to SR, and in a set SR it finds this generalizable global minimum. And then it stops there, and it never leaves that local minimum. So, uh, so it never touches on those non-generalizable global uh, minimum of the training loss. Um, we don't make any assumptions on the input dimension, so they could be large. So the only uh, dependency on the input dimension is this. So the, the test error depends on input dimension, but it also depends on the initialization. So you can make the initialization smaller to cancel out the influence of the input dimension. So um, that's basically the only dependency. Question? Okay, can you show the drawing in the next slide again? This one? No, after that. A drawing, oh, sorry. Sure. So we start with um, very close to zero. The reason why we cannot start exactly at zero is because zero is a saddle point. You never move. And, uh, and uh, when you start very so a point with very close to zero is of low complexity because in a definition, we say if a network is approximately equal to, um, uh, is e approximately compressible, then it's of, um, it's of low complexity. So uh, a small initialization is approximately compressible because you can just um, approximate by a zero network. So um, that's why it's a uh, low complexity. Uh, the step size, you know, you cannot take the step steps to be very large because then you don't uh, converge even because of the optimization reason. Uh, other than that, we don't have um, a hard constraint on the step size. Um, I'm, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any relation. Yeah. Because there's, well, there's the only constraint for parameter estimation for the kind of problems that you show is that the system has to be a fast weight system. 
Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, I'm not aware of um, uh, saturation. I, I'm happy to chat offline. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. Um, and uh, just another um, quick plot. So the weight matrix indeed has low complexity throughout the training if you have a synthetic setup. So the setup is very similar to the previous one. I just make the uh, the, the teacher network, the, the true network of size R. To, uh, 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 that, I just set R to be 1 to, for simplicity. And you can see that the largest singular value you know, increases to 1, and the second largest singular value uh, stays around 0.1. So basically, the, the weight matrix is approximately rank 1 uh, through all the training. All right, just a, a quick summary on the transition theory. So um, uh, we need the informative complex measures for deepness. Some of the existing ones um, are already pretty good, but we probably we need uh, tighter and tighter complexity measures. And algorithms have an implicit regularization effect to, to minimize the complex measure. And just to uh, reemphasize this, so the the generalization theory has a lot of things to do with optimization, actually even more things to do with optimization than the architectural choice uh, somehow. Um, so another really open question is that um, understanding the statistical structure of the data, so uh, in the sense that so we have to assume something about the intrinsic complexity of the data. And uh, for now, we don't have very good ways to describe um, the structure of the data, especially the structure of the input. So we know how to describe the structure of the, the relationship between the output and the input, but the input itself is hard to uh, describe. All right. So um, I guess um, um, I can take a, f you know, if there are some questions, I can take a few questions and before I move on to the next part. By the way, the talk is until 5.30. Uh, there the, the was a little bit uh, typo, I think, before on the website, but yeah, anyway. Um, Question? Right. Yes. So, so the the result I just showed before is very simplistic. Like uh, you assume almost everything you can assume. Um, of course, you know you can add noise and consider all other variants. Um, they are all interesting you know, open questions. So there is uh, there is one thing that is very convenient about quadratic division, which is um, um, even though you, you have nonlinearity, there's still some um, rotational invariance in the in the system, um, so that you can use the linear algebraic um, uh, tricks. So so basically, you can still use linear algebra to reason about quadratic uh, activation, um, but uh, when there is a ReLU uh, activation, then all the linear algebraic um, techniques break. So that's a technical version. Of it. Can you say again? Let's say, uh, let's say the ReLU proposes some uh, low complexity network, mm -hmm. but with some noise. Yep. Uh, then how does the noise enter the Skillet matrix? Or can you like, have a sense of this? Um, I, I think our current work, you know, if you work out carefully, at least it tolerates very, very little noise. Uh, I, I would guess uh, if you have more noise, of course, the, the techniques have to be changed. But the, um, the noise should affect the same, uh, in the same way as the standard way, like uh, you have like a one over a square root, uh, one over a square of the noise or something. That's my guess. Um, okay. Um, then don't you end up being like trying to optimize uh, the output of the network based on handshakes to finding the arc max of the output of the new network based on handshakes? Yep. For example, like going to two layer networks, mm -hmm. you want to maximize the speed of the different network based on handshakes. Does any of this say anything about weight centralization based on handshakes when we're not learning the weight based on Um, I I don't think so. Um, I have to think about it a little bit more. I, you know, on, on, off top, the top of my head, I, I don't think they apply. Yeah. All right. I guess um, let's move on to um, the 
ne next 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes of the talk. So I'm going to uh, briefly describe um, uh, some of the recent theoretical results on unsupervised learning and, uh, and reinforcement learning. So um, the part three is going to be about uh, statistical theory of uh, uh, GANs. So um, you know, speaking of GANs, you know, what theory could possibly contribute? In my opinion, you know, um, the first question is, what distributions do GAN learn with finite samples? Can we have uh, some kind of like a pike learning kind of type of statistical learning theory for GANs? And, uh, and how do we measure the quality of the genetic images? Um, this could be a both theoretical and empirical question, but I hope that theory could also help in this case. And of course, there's also a computational problem. How do we train GANs faster and better? So in this talk, I'm going to only going to talk about the first question. How do we uh, have a kind of a pike learning type of statistical learning theory for GANs? So just a very quick recap of uh, um, the GANs. So in GANs, we are trying to learn to sample from samples. Uh, we want to um, uh, map this white noise to um, uh, for example, real image. I'm going to real use real image as a running example in this talk. So um, the generator, which is a new network that takes um, Gaussian input and, um, and maps it to uh, some distribution. So x, the generated distribution, uh, generative variable is uh, x is equal to g sub theta of z. And uh, we want the distribution of x to be similar to the distribution of the real images, let's say. Right. So, um, and one of the you know interesting thing about this is that you know in the um, even in the you know the the freezing or in the parameterization we don't parameterize the density um, um, itself. We parameterize the generator, and uh, and in many of the cases you know when you have such a generator you don't know how to compute the density of the generative uh, generated distribution, and uh, that means that the loss function also probably have to be based on samples, and that's the probably the key idea of GANs. Um, to define that, let me um, just uh, define some uh, simple notations. Let's p to be the distribution of the real images, and p hat to be the uh, empirical version of it. It's a distribution over any empirical, empirical samples from p. And uh, let p sub theta to be the distribution of the generated images generated from the generator g sub theta. And p hat sub theta is a distribution over any empirical samples from the generative, uh, generated distribution. P state, P sub theta. And our goal is to um, find P sub theta such that P sub theta is as close to P as possible. And as I said before, you know, P sub theta may not have a density, or the density is intractable. And, um, and one of the points of GANs is that we can define loss function that can be evaluated with only samples. So we define some kind of distance measure between the distribution P hat theta and P hat, and use that as the distance measure. Right, so uh, and what distance measures concretely we are going to define? So we're going to define it through a discriminator family, uh, F, which is often uh, a family of new networks. So in the original version of GAN, so this distance measure is defined as the maximum likelihood loss for classifying real images from fake samples using the discriminators in F. So it's a binary classification problem. You can write down a log likelihood. Um, in, um, for the simplicity, in this talk, I'm going to talk mostly about W GANs, Wasserstein GANs, where the, um, the loss function is defined as um, the maximum dif uh, discrepancy between the mean of f on the generated, distribu generated distribution and the mean on the, uh, on the true distribution. Um, there are two things I think we have to um, uh, um, be careful about, which is um, so we can only evaluate the mean on the empirical distribution. So that's why I'm putting p hat theta and p hat here. And also we are maximizing over a family of new networks. And uh, in math, this is defined as the, uh, it is called f integral probability metric, IPM, f IPM, between the empirical um, true distribution p hat and empirical generated distribution p hat theta. And uh, um, the reason why we call it the Wasserstein GAN is that if you take f to be the set of all one Lipschitz, one Lipschitz functions, then the distance f sub f is equal to the Wasserstein distance, um, which I'm going to define as w. So um, if you take f to be a new network, um, a family of new network with one Lipschitz, uh, that are one Lipschitz, then f uh, is going to be a subset of all one Lipschitz function. So that's kind of why W sub F is um, often weaker than the Wasserstein distance W. Um, OK, so now let's 
um, get onto the question, what distributions do GAN uh, learn? So, um, so basically, we want to ask the question, you know, if the training succeeds, can we guarantee that uh, the generated distribution P sub theta is close to the true distribution P? And let's translate this to uh, a mathematical statement. Basically, um, that means that the training succeed means that the training loss WF between P hat theta and P hat is small. And the question is whether that implies that P theta and P are close in vast distance. And we allow some you know, error G of uh, epsilon, which depends on epsilon. So um, let's just get a closer uh, look on these two quantities. On the left-hand side, uh, we call it training loss because we are measuring the distance between empirical distributions. And also, uh, it's a weak discriminator because we are using F as the discriminator. On the right-hand side, we have test loss, which uses population distance because we are measuring the distance between P set and P. And uh, we are using strong discriminators like Wasserstein distance. And um, you know, the difference between, you know, there are two differences between training and test. One is the distance, uh, empirical versus population, and the other is the discriminators. When you have two quantities that differ by two places, then the most natural way to link them is that you meet them uh, in the middle, uh, in the sense that you, know, you define some uh, intermediate quantity um, and try to link them you know, through the intermediate quantity. And it, the, the meaning for intermediate quantity seems to be that the, the WF distance between P theta and P. So you use a population distance, but you use a weak discriminator. And uh, if you kind of look closer about these two links, then the first link is basically about the generalization of discriminators, right? So, so how, um, whether uh, the distance, the empirical distance small implies that the population distance is also small. And the second link is basically about the approximability or distinguishability of the discriminators in the sense that whether the distance WF is uh, close enough to the distance or the Wasserstein distance. So, um, in one of the work with um, um, Aurora and Gu and uh, Liang and Zhang, so we um, studied the kind of the, the trade-off between generalization and approximability, and we found a kind of pessimistic dilemma in the following sense. So um, suppose you have an f to be a new network of size c, and n is much bigger uh, than c. So the number of examples is say qu quite much bigger than c, and then on the left-hand side. The generalization theory is OK, because you can just use the standard concentration inequality to get that the empirical distance between P theta and P is close to the population distance under WF with the weak discriminator. So that's fine. However, on the left-hand side, we have some, on the right-hand side, we have some problem, because um, WF is not a good approximation of W. So the, discrim the weak discriminator uh, WF cannot approximate W uh, for some distribution Q. And what is worse is that such a counterexample Q has support only on roughly uh, C images. That means that you can find a distribution Q that has very low support that fools the discriminator. So in other words, you have good generalization but poor approximability, and that could possibly uh, lead to poor diversity because you could possibly learn a Q, um, distribution Q such that um, uh, it only supports on a few number of um, images. Or in other words, small discriminator cannot detect mode collapse. And actually, empirically, people have found that um, mode collapse is indeed uh, a concern in GANs. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you may wonder, you know, what if I choose a very powerful discriminator? Of course, if I choose a very powerful discriminator, there's the first problem is that I have a computational issue. I don't really know how to optimize over all one Lipschitz functions. But even without the optimization issue, there's a reverse problem because the generalization um, um, between the empirical distance and the, the population distance is going to be a problem, even though the approximability is fine. So we have this uh, uh, pessimistic dilemma um, 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 in this paper published last year. And recently, we have um, another result that attempts to go beyond the dilemma. So um, by a restricted approximability, which I'm defining um, below. So note that you know, 
uh, the problem comes from that WF doesn't approximate W. However, if you look closely, then actually this is too much uh, of an ask for us. So actually, we only care about WF to approximate W for those distribution Q that is possibly be generated by your generator. So this pose, uh, um, impose a restriction on the family of distributions you care about. You only care about those distributions that can be possibly generated by the generator. So you only care about those Qs that can equal to P theta. And when um, you only care about this, then uh, suddenly uh, it sounds like uh, things are fine. So uh, for a particular general class, right? so you define some G sub theta, it's possible to design corresponding parameterized discriminator class with restricted approximability uh, in the following sense. So uh, um, we can hope to show that uh, for all distribution Q that can be possibly generated, then the Wasser's distance approximate, uh, sorry, the, the WF distance approximate the Wasser's distance in this sense. Uh, with the loss in the power, um, um, you know, with a power of two loss. So the WF distance is sandwiched between the square of the Wasser distance and the, the Wasser distance. So, and we can show this for um, uh, several uh, generator classes. Um, so for Gaussian, mix of Gaussian, and exponential family, we can design such discriminator class to have such restricted approximability. And also for uh, invertible, or actually injective new networks, uh, we can also show uh, such restri restricted approximability. So let me just spend one slide to talk about um, such restricted approximability for invertible new networks. So um, the setup is as follows. So we have a network that maps dimension k to dimension d. So k is smaller than d, as shown in the figure. Uh, and uh, the network is, um, uh, we assume that the network is injective in the sense that Every input maps to uh, different inputs map to different output. And uh, for example, an L layer network with leaky uh, ReLU activation and full rent weight matrices will satisfy uh, such injective assumption. So under this assumption, then we can design uh, a family of discriminators, which is basically an L plus two layer network with some special structure at the end. Uh, and if you have such a uh, discriminator, then we can show such restricted approximability in the sense that, uh, let me parse this equation for you. So on the very left-hand side, this is the test error we care about. So this is the Wasserstein distance between the learned distribution and the true distribution. And the first inequality is the approximation between uh, um, uh, WF and W, right? So we show that WF with the weak discriminator can approximate Wasserstein distance. And the second uh, inequality, um, you know, approximate equality, is the generalization between the empirical distribution and, um, and the population distribution. So we show that uh, the tuning loss is actually close to the WF distance between P theta and P. So, so basically, at the end, we show that the test loss is bounded by uh, square root of the tuning loss. And if the tuning succeed, then this means that the test uh, could possibly succeed. So um, the open questions along this line, I think, are uh, how do we remove the injective assumption? So it's not that easy to find a network with injective um, 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 assumptions. So you have to you know, make the ways you know, well conditioned and, and design a network in a way so that it always increases the uh, dimension. So, um, and, you know, so the open question is whether we can remove such assumption and whether we can prove stronger approximation inequalities, and whether we can use this uh, to achieve better um, uh, practical results. So for now, we have some experiments that shows that uh, such inequality makes sense, uh, but the experiments are only on synthetic data, because some of these you know, quantities are not um, uh, easily computable uh, on real data, so we verify the theory on only synthetic data. But I hope that some of this uh, can be used for practical um, purpose. All right, so um, okay, let me move on to um, another part with only one slide about the theory of embeddings. How do we reason about representation learning? So this is more about unsupervised learning and the modeling choice uh, in unsupervised learning. So uh, in the last few years in NLP, so embeddings are very popular, and the basic pipeline for embeddings is that you take some 
unsupervised data set, and you map them, you know, and use that to, you know, recover or to um, 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 compute some embeddings uh, for, for example, words, sentences, or paragraphs, and then use the embeddings for downstream tasks. And one of the, um, the formulation question about representation learning I'm wondering about is how do we formalize representation learning? Right? How do we kind of have a framework to reason about this kind of you know, problems and approach that we are using? Um, so in uh, some of the recent paper I was involved in, um, we uh, have uh, some genital approach uh, for, uh, for studying this. So basically, the, at the very high level, the idea is that you design some genitive model for the language. So the genitive model is um, you know, function that maps you know, the parameters and the latent variables to um, the sentences in a corpus. And under this genitive model, um, you know, this is assumption that you make uh, about the language. And then under these assumptions, uh, you can, we can reason about properties of the learning embeddings. We can show um, different word embedding methods could possibly you know, give results uh, on some uh, downstream tasks, like an analogy task. And we could possibly design uh, new embeddings. For example, uh, when you have such a jet model in hand, then you can say, maybe my embedding should be the latent variable. Then I can recover, try to recover latent variable. So this, um, 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 this kind of philosophy are used in a, um, you know, a sequence of work um, uh, about you know, word embeddings, sense embeddings, or sentence embeddings. Um, and, and recently, we also have some work on how do we embed rare words and uh, uh, phrases. So I think the open question here is that how do we incorporate uh, syntactic information in the modeling? So in all of these you know, gentle models, the models are very simplistic. Uh, it's simply just a random mock um, in the semantic space, basically. Uh, and we don't use any syntactic information. That seems to be the bottleneck to have better embeddings. And, um, and whether there are any other effective frameworks for understanding representation learning. This is just the one way to do it. We use a genetic model. All right. So uh, let's move on to the next part, the, the last part about um, um, this tutorial. So this is about some theory about deep reinforcement learning. And the main theme here is that how do we design sample efficient algorithms in continuous state space? So um, I think the, the, the main theoretical challenges in you know, deep reinforcement learning is that you know, basically you have all the challenges about deep learning plus uh, sequential decision making. Um, just to restate some of these challenges, we have high dimensional state space. We have nonlinear function approximators like policies, but policies, dynamics, and Q functions. Uh, we have non convex maximizations, and we also have a sample efficiency uh, problem, um, like the generalization theory problem. So, um, one particular kind of topic I'm, I'd like to uh, briefly mention in this talk is a model based deep reinforcement learning. Um, recently, there are a few work that shows very pr promising results on uh, model-based reinforcement or deep reinforcement learning can reduce the sample complexity um, uh, compared to model-free reinforcement learning. And the part of the reason why model-based reinforcement learning is believed to be more sample efficient is that it can, uses, it can use state information, the observation from the state, uh, instead of only rewards in policy gradient. And recently, there are a few work on um, um, theoretical progress on controlling linear dynamical models. So you have a linear dynamical model, which is called IOQR, and you want to control, achieve the maximum reward um, um, on the linear dynamical models. And there are uh, sample complexity guarantees on how do we, um, um, how do we reason about you know, linear dynamical models. So for nonlinear dynamics, uh, it's a little bit tricky because even uh, a convergence guarantee is not known. So we don't even know whether we use, uh, whether we can converge when we use model-based re deep reinforcement learning um, for learning um, nonlinear dynamical model. So an annoying issue is that the initial convergence is good, but asymptotic convergence is difficult. So you can run model-based reinforcement for a little bit, and that's pr perfectly fine, and then the, um, the reward is no longer you know, increasing, and uh, in this paper by Naga Bandi et al., they uh, have to switch to model free algorithms afterwards. So, um, motivated by this, you know, we um, uh, design a framework uh, with collaborators um, that under which we can prove some asymptotic convergence guarantees 
for model-based reinforcement learning. So here's the framework. The, the high-level algorithm is as follows. So we basically repeat with two steps. Um, the first step is that we maximize the analytical, uh, an analytical lower bound of the reward based on the trajectories over both the policy and the model. So, so we build the analytical lower bound of the reward, and we optimize that lower bound. And the second step is that we collect new samples from the current policy and recompute uh, the, the, the analytical, analytical lower bound. So uh, with this, you know, I'm, I'm not going into details, but the general idea is that with this framework of model-based reinforcement learning, we can show that the reward can monotonically increase to a local maximum under the assumption that model-free policy optimization can be solved. So, and uh, we have um, uh, tried our experiment, uh, um, theoretical results, um, like uh, our algorithm on a Majuko benchmark uh, that set. So this is an um, experiment on uh, Cheetah, half Cheetah. Um, and here I'm plotting uh, several uh, algorithms. So basically, um, the top three ones are all variants of our uh, proposed algorithm. And the sign one, the, the middle one, is the previous model-based approach. And the bottom two are uh, model free approach. One is TRPO, and the other is DDPG. And uh, in the x-axis, I have number of samples. So the, here, this is the only thing we care about. We only care about number of samples. Uh, and we can see that um, uh, our uh, algorithm, the, the blue one, can converge to uh, near optimal re uh, uh, reward uh, with much fewer number of samples. Actually, this is the first uh, uh, work that to, uh, to achieve near optimal reward on half GTAC using model-based reinforcement learning with a single dynamical model. And, um, and in general, I think we observe that we have a 3 to 10 times uh, sample efficiency speed up than the model-free approach. All right, so uh, I guess this, um, um, I'm, with this, I'm going to summarize the whole talk. So um, I've talked about supervised learning, where I focus on the interactions between optimization, generalization, and choices of architectures. Uh, we've talked about unsupervised learning, the theory of GANs, and representation learning. And also, I briefly touched on uh, some recent progress on model-based reinforcement learning with asymptotic convergence theorem. Um, there are some topics I, don't, I didn't uh, have time to cover. So security in deep learning, especially defending against uh, adversarial examples. This is um, a pretty hot topic these days. And uh, certainly, some theory is required to have um, a provable defense. Uh, and certainly, quantification, I think this is another uh, very interesting area. Uh, that they are um, that are not quite um, explored enough, um, and uh, fairness in deep learning is another hot area in deep learning. So we have um, all um, you know a series of fairness issues um, with machine learning and deep learning that we have to resolve, and also meta learning, which is another hot area. All right, so just uh, some concluding thought. Um, there is a burst of um, recent promising theoretical results on deep learning, and I think. Uh, some of these results have um, um, the potential to provide more intuitions and guidance to practice. We've seen at the end um, our work on reinforcement learning do have um, um, pretty good practical implications. We design our, our theoretical driven, uh, theory driven algorithm do outperform the existing benchmark. And um, a third point I'd like to make is that um, Actually, uh, there is also a broader impact of, um, of this in the sense that um, back to math, the study of deep learning actually also motivates development of new tools. So we will look at uh, the mathematical literature. Um, there are not um, um, enough amount of tools for um, studying questions like deep learning. So this motivates a lot of development of new tools. In, in all of this theory work, we have to develop some new tools for studying all of these nonlinearities. And finally, um, I'm pretty optimistic that theory um, could possibly sustain or boost the progress of deep learning and AI. Um, and I hope that theory can be more useful. Thank you.